All right. Good morning, everyone. Today we are going to host uh, the webinar of Professor Ignazio Crepons from Veracruz University. He is going to talk about uh, the complexity of the complexity of vulnerability, what that means from a multi-phenological perspective. I hope uh, you all will enjoy this uh, presentation. And uh, Ignazio, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, I have to like, uh, well, say thank you to Professor uh, Ferrarello for this opportunity for sharing my my work, my uh, current uh, research, research agenda on vulnerability. And well, thank you also for these efforts of translating me to sign language. I want to thank you also very a lot yeah, thanks. As, uh, to this effort of the university. I, well, hopefully my English is not that bad, <laughs> at least understandable no. enough for the audience and I, I don't make uh, I don't want to make this like uh, harder uh, for you all, especially for the uh, interpreter. But well, and what I want to do today, basically, I um, decided to well, I took this as a talk, which means that uh, I want to talk. I want to talk to you, and I want to listen. To what do you think? about this uh, topic, which is like very trendy in many uh, fields in the academic uh, studies in, in different um, perspectives and approaches, and also in different disciplines, the topic of vulnerability. And well, like I come from a more um, philosophical background. So I, I do philosophy, ethics, and particularly, I come from the phenomenological tradition so my approach to the concept of vulnerability is more like a philosophical oriented. And what I especially uh, want is to, um, well, to start an attempt at clarification of what this concept actually means. What is vulnerability? What is to be vulnerable? And a issue that is very interesting and very important for me is the normative um, consequences or the normative relations, or perhaps other way to say it is in what, in which regard uh, vulnerability can be uh, also understood as a source of normativity. Why uh, normativity, well, sorry, vulnerability matters in order to um, justify or uh, clarify our uh, ethical framework, so to speak, or a, or a moral orientation. And well, so I understand this idea of normativity, normativity in a, a broad sense that involves, well, of course, the how it is to be understood the concept of vulnerability, for instance, with regard to the discussions on human rights. That is something that really matters for me. Also in the context of ethics and especially bioethics, and of course, something that is very important for me, this is more like in the context of the theoretical, well, ethics and philosophy, is the relation between our understanding and experiencing of values and vulnerability, which is something that, well, some, uh, some people like Martha Nussbaum, for instance, emphasized all the time that if we, uh, well, vulnerability somehow is that make us aware of the, the sense of values and, and normativity. So well, in any ways, my, my approach is not uh, precisely the way uh, Martha Nussbaum approaches this, this topic, but at least in this particular um, issue, I think we agreed, agree upon this, uh, the, the relation between vulnerability and uh, the origin or uh, the experience of values. So um, basically what I want to present today is how I approach to the concept of vulnerability and what are the uh, conceptual problems involved in our understanding of this subject 
and as I did mention also, I want to um, well seek uh, to how it is possible to relate vulnerability to the moral emotions, ethics, and this um, or um, context of, of normativity. So, well, first of all, for instance, something that uh, in many, many contexts we find when the people start speaking about vulnerability is that vulnerability is grounded in our embodied nature. So you have this in many contexts in the uh, theory of uh, human rights and theory of um, ethics, sociology, bioethics. However, it is not that clear what they um, understand by uh, embodiment and the body. So the first concept I, I also, well, I am very interested in to clarify is what is the concept of body, which is involved in the um, explanation of what vulnerability means. So first of all, this, uh, all these people are, uh, well, agree on the idea of vulnerability is grounded in our embodied nature. We are vulnerable because we are embodied um, beings. However, as I mentioned, it's this body and embodiment refers to a very precise uh, meaning, which is not always explicit in these explanations. This embodiment means not only the physical body, which is of course involved in, in what we mean by vulnerability. We are a um, subject to be harmed or even of course destroyed, damaged, but in this regard, precisely, one of the, the, the concepts that are like in the, in the core of um, my approach of the, on the concept of embodiment is what does it mean harm? What, what does harm mean? Harm is not exactly, as we, we, we will see in, in a couple of minutes, it's not exactly the same as damage. This is something I, I do like about English because for instance, in Spanish, we have the same expression. I don't know how it is in, in Italian, but in the Spanish, we have this more, more or less the same expression. I mean, there are like different ways to say it, but in English, it is, there exists this difference between damage and harm. And damage, usually its context belongs more to the, if, for instance, something that somehow stops working or uh, is about to get destroyed. So it's something more physical. To get damaged is to, to, to get the, like a stop in the, in the fun uh, functions or working. And harm belongs to a more experiential sense, even in the, in the common language. When I, I get harm, it's, I, it's more related to, to feelings, to get wounded, even um, in the very corporeal sense, to get harmed is to get injured, not damaged, but injured. So, I, and, and then uh, the, the first concept I, I, uh, I'm, I am interested in to clarify is the concept of, of, of harm with regard to this idea of embodiment. So I um, put here in my presentation, this uh, short quote by Farta, Marta Feynman. She says that we are, um, well, we are vulnerable because we are dependent upon and embedded, embedded with it within social relationships and institutions throughout the life course. This also means uh, to be vulnerable. So be vul being vulnerable is a constant and unavoidable state and try as we might, we cannot more escape being vulnerable than we can escape of our bodies. So we are like, determined by our bodies to be um, like what we are and vulnerability is essential to our embodied condition. But as I did mention, the, um, the, the problem here first is what is body? How we should understand body in this context? And especially if vulnerability is related to um, harm, and in this regard, uh, I, something I, I start doing is to distinguish between vulnerability and fragility. So 
in the in the even metaphorically we can use fragility to refer to ourselves or even to to speak about us as I am fragile. So please uh, take take care. With my, for instance, that, that when we speak about the the heart, the feelings. So, but as a matter of fact, the concept of fragility belongs more, as I mentioned, it to a more physical dimension, which is something like that is possible to to break, so to damage. That is where I will put this notion of fragility and in, in order to have in the in the in our context the notion of vulnerability both fragility and vulnerability i related each other both are so to speak um rela relational or uh where to say accidental circumstantial uh, predicates so there are no, nothing is uh, by itself vulnerable or fragile. If I want to, to define whatever you want, a, a cup or a, a chair, I will say something, well, a, a chair is something that uh, I use to, to get seats or a, a pen is something I use to, to write, it's a, it's a tool or whatever, but you don't start explaining the meaning of anything saying that this is fragile or this is vulnerable. Vulnerability and fragility belong to the context where certain kind of relation with other objects or other beings uh, are in uh, at the stake. So vulnerability is a circumstantial uh, predicate, an accidental predicate, a predicate that involves relations and not necessarily the how do you say, uh, the, the very definition of what we are like uh, speaking about. However, in the case of human being and human experience, and this is perhaps my uh, ultimate aim in this research, vulnerability is something essential. So the vulnerability is something that actually defines us better than other predicates, even though that from a ontological or well, a use, I, I, I am trying to avoid the technicalities, but as I mentioned it, from the, the point of view of the definition, the conceptual definition of anything, we never start uh, speaking about uh, this thing is vulnerable. Now, vulnerability belongs to, to the context, to the circumstances. But what happens with the human beings? The, with the human beings happens the, exactly the other way around, precisely because we are essentially explained in our being in relation to what we are with regard of, of, on a, of a context and with regard to particular circumstances, historical circumstances. And this all, especially if we take in, in uh, consideration what we are as embodied beings, what we have as a result of this is that vulnerability belongs to the very essence of what we are as human beings. So th this is like the, the uh, basic and more general uh, perspective I am like trying to approach to the, to the problem of vulnerability. So, uh, well, I, I, in the, the last part of this, uh, um, this, this session, I started mentioning it when I want to understand for the concept of the body, why it is problematic, the human body, uh, because of the reason I already explained, because of this essential uh, sense of vulnerability that belongs to the human existence, human body has a different meaning. And when we speak of embodied nature, we mean something different that we um, refer to our embodied condition in terms of what, well, just to say it in a broad sense, the natural sciences says about, say about us, I just mean medicine, physiology, and so on. There is something else. I mean, of course we are animals, like the, the rest of the animals, we are like, uh, we have um, a biological uh, body. However, the human beings uh, also uh, bestow, so to speak, we, we, we bring, 
a different sense of a meaning of this embodiment. And in this context is where we understand the notion of vulnerability beyond this other context that belongs to other uh, beings that we may uh, put with regard to the notion of um, fragility. So the other and perhaps the last issue I want to um, claim is whether vulnerability necessarily have a negative meaning. So this is something I, I am not exactly sure. Actually, I have to confess this. I am not exactly sure. I, I started studying a, a philosopher from Lithuania, from the phenomenological tradition. His name is Emmanuel Levinas, and he explicitly claims for a positive dimension of vulnerability, uh, which is uh, related to the ethics, the primacy of ethics in human experience. So I am not exactly sure whether in all contexts vulnerability should have this positive uh, meaning as Levinas claims, because in many other contexts, of course, vulnerability and especially this, uh, or as long as it is related to this concept of harm, it seems to have also a, a negative meaning, which uh, perhaps it is important also to like to put uh, attention on it. And well, that I already mentioned, this is the, the core of my um, approach, the relation between vulnerability and harm. Vulnerability is to be understood as a disposition, a circumstantial disposition expressed in the form of an accidental predicate related to the form of interaction between that wish to be considered vulnerable, since it can be harmed and which is able to harm it. So what is interesting, I mentioned that vulnerability is an essential uh, dimension of human experience. However, the way of if this uh, phenomenon of vulnerability appears is always in uh, certain circumstances or certain disposition. This is interesting also because even though we are all essentially vulnerable, in determinate circumstances, we are more vulnerable than in other circumstances. And also our uh, bodies and the and social and historical condition of our embodiment make certain groups more vulnerable than other groups. It, um, well, allows <clears throat> perhaps a, or actually had allowed a theoretical perspective, especially in the modern philosophy, especially in the modern uh, theory of the state regarding the autonomy of subjectivity. So when we, we, when we go to this modern and liberal theories of justice, for taking an example, and when the philosophers start thinking about what is justice and what is the nature of the state in the political sense, most of the times there is a presupposition of a way of understanding, um, how do you say this, um, humanity, they, what is a human or a man? These, these people speak about man. There's no woman, okay? In this speech, it's just man. So it's a man, but without nobody, in abstraction of this embodied condition, as I mentioned, this is pre precisely the, the, the reason women are not like uh, involved in this uh, modern account. I am, of, of course, criticizing this, okay? So <laughs> they are wrong. They are wrong. This is precisely my point. So there is. In these liberal and modern theories about justice, I am thinking about people like John Rawls, which theory of justice is very interesting, very important. However, or and also Kant for mentioning like the classical philosophers, or even Plato, whatever, but especially the modern in the modern context, there is an idea of thinking humanity with regard to the um, autonomous capacity 
for um, active performances in abstraction of the empirical circumstances that belongs to, for instance, uh, this um, uh, corporeal uh, embodied th these positions. And many people in the uh, theory of vulnerability and the care ethics uh, claimed, people like Marta Feynman, for instance, claimed that, well, this is wrong because we are not that. They are making this abstraction in order to justify a theoretical account of justice and liberty and what liberty means in a liberal uh, society. But as a matter of fact, the um, actual conditions of many people in different contexts, even in the, in the modern uh, countries, are not able to reach the same experience of liberty and capability and capacity for uh, perform the same performances as the, the rest of the people. And not only because, of course, this is an issue, and perhaps one of the most important issues, not only because economical uh, reasons, but also because a conditions that belongs to what they actually are in the more primitive or primary way possible, my body, see someone who like, I, I born Mexican, <laughs> for, for instance, I can do nothing about it. I mean, perhaps I can change my nationality. It is not easy, especially if, if I want to become American, this is uh, complicated. There are ways, but uh, okay. But for instance, I, I can, I cannot, I can perhaps uh, change my, my hair and pretend I am blonde and so on, but no, no, no I, I am what I am. So, and I belong to, to a tradition. I have an, a strong Mexican accent and well, certain cultural roots that actually belong to me and are expressed in many respects in, my, in, in what I am as this body that is speaking to all of you at this moment. So, this is what is out of these uh, considerations and why it is out precisely because what I mentioned at the beginning of my, my uh, presentation, which is that nothing is to be defined from this uh, kind of predicates. This is something circumstantial. This is not, not something essential. So we are philosophers, we want something universal. Why you come to us to speak about vulnerability we, we are not all vulnerable. What, what do you mean by vulnerability? Vulnerability is something circumstantial, accidental, it is, uh, belongs to determinate relations. Oh, too bad, you're Mexican. Ah, so is life, you know. Uh, fix your country, you know. This is, is your problem. Yes, yes, it's, my, it's our problem. Yes, that, that's right. However, our po just, point is just to, to uh, remark this. This notion of humanity and liberties you are speaking about is abstract. That belongs perhaps to a, a minority of people that can imagine or their lives and their way of life that corresponding to this autonomous sense of, I can do whatever I want, I am free, and all this idea that belongs, by the way, to certain, well, I cannot speak about, about the, the American way of life. I am speaking to Americans. Let, let's uh, let's criticize the Europeans better. Yes. Oh my God, no. Susi is Italian. <laughs> Whatever. You know what I mean. And but as, as I mentioned it, this not only belongs to other countries like my country, but it's something that we actually see this uh, uh, in countries like the United States. There is people that is discriminated because of their embodied condition in many respects, the way they also want to express their, their, the, the sense they give to their, their body or their, their lives that is expressed through their bodies in many ways. And all this expression does not fit with this uh, abstract idea of humanity. So that pre precisely uh, takes apart the dimension of vulnerability that's something we have to overcome somehow. So something that is like accidental is a uh, it's an issue. You cannot make something like to be better or whatever. No, no, no. 
Hold a second. This is what I am like trying to, to say. This is what we are. <laughs> we cannot avoid vulnerability uh, by all ways or all, in all means, it, by all means. It is something that belongs to what uh, is a human being. So my, my aim then is for, for some of you, perhaps at this point, this is very obvious and for, for I have to tell you, this is the, what the philosophers do. We problematize what is obvious, okay? So it's obvious that we are all vulnerable. What in the context of philosophy, it happens that uh, it's not that obvious when we want to define something as essentially vulnerable, considering the kind of predicate that vulnerability is. So I already mentioned it, what vulnerability, uh, more or less, or at least what in what context we have to understand the concept of vulnerability. I mentioned it, the relation with vulnerability and harm. So perhaps the, the, the concept I have to address now is the concept of harm. So this is one of the things I, uh, well, I am very most interested in too now. What, what is harm? So we have to, we can to understand, we can understand harm at least in two ways, uh, especially bodily harm. Let me, let's start for the easiest to context. What is, what is a bodily harm? So bodily harm can make a mean a being wounded. So in the sense of getting hurt. So this part, this meaning of harm free, uh, relates to our condition of uh, physical fragility. So um, in, a, in a certain respect, or the possibility of undergoing damage also in a certain respect, but as a matter of fact, uh, neither vulnerability nor harm corresponds to this uh, notion of physical fragility or the possibility of undergoing damage. But vulnerability has to uh, uh, means more, or perhaps its primal meaning is the possibility of being wounded or harmed that involves an affective dimension of experience. And this is something that does not correspond to the way other objects, the fragility of a building, for instance, or a, or a car, so or a chair. So the, the, a chair is something that is able to receive physical damage and is in its uh, subject of undergoing of the possible to meet the, under, the possibility of, of damage in this uh, physical sense. But the chair or the, the building, as long as we know, they don't feel this experience of getting wounded or hurt. And this is what belongs to the concepts of harm in, in this perspective. So, but what else? So harm perhaps in one hand can be related to certain afflictive experience such as pain or suffering. So this is harm, but also harm. And this is where the phenomenology comes in, into consideration. Uh, harm is, can be also understood with regard to a, a frustration of the continuity of an ongoing experiencing process resulting in a deprivation or a decrease of practical capacities. This is something that is very important for me because, well, a little bit of phenomenology, just a little bit. For the phenomenological tradition, what makes our uh, body what it is, I mean, the, the, the primal meaning of the lived body is its capability or its capacity for self-motivated movement. Husserl, the founder of this tradition, Edmund Husserl, uses this uh, notion of a body, well, it's something that we also find in other philosophers like Spinoza, for instance, in the, in the philosophical tradition. A body somehow is what it can. Husserl uses this expression of I can. So this system of capabilities the, the, the body is the unity of a system of practical capabilities and not a thing. A body is something that can do, can perform certain activities, especially the capability of self-motivated movement. Once this 
uh, we are deprived of certain capabilities, especially the capability of self-motivated movement. I, I think, I, I guess, so this is what I, I suggest, we can experience, uh, speak about harm, or this is a, a, a way we can speak of harm. So the deprivation of cer certain uh, practical capabilities, particularly the capability of self-motivated movement. Well, I had this, this from, from Descartes, but also emphasizes this difference between the body, which is not a thing, and the lift body. This is an example, a classic example. I, I wanted also to mention Descartes pretty briefly because we used to blame the, the poor uh, uh, René Descartes of this a split between body and mind, and also his account of the body as a mechanism, which is something that we have in, in many, many different contexts. And no, that wasn't exactly what uh, René Descartes meant, meant with these uh, ideas. And he uses a very beautiful example in his meditations of uh, first philosophy. He says, I am not lodged in my body like a pilot in his ship, but besides that, I am joined to it very closely and indeed so compounded and intermingled with my body that a form as it were a single wall with it. For if this were not so, when my body hurt, is hurt, I would not on I would not on that, that account feel pain. I who I am only a thinking thing, this is why, how Descartes speaks but I should perceive the wound by my understanding alone, just as a pilot see by sight if any damage occurs into his ship. Similarly, when the body needed food or drink, I should have an explicit understanding of the fact instead of having confused sensation of hunger and thirst. For these sensations of hunger, thirst, pain, and so on are nothing but confused modes of thinking which arise from the union and as it were intermingling of the mind and body. This is very interesting because this, we find this in the 17th century. 17th century, yes, more or less, a, with a Descartes, which was blamed as the, the, the who committed this split, this strong split between mind and body. But what actually Descartes is speaking to us, is saying to us is, no, 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 look at our, a relation with the body that belongs to us, so um, this is actually the expression he uses, is completely different to the uh, the other body bodies. See the the external bodies is the expression they they can use as aliena corpore says in in, in Latin. So it's something that the, the body that doesn't belong to me and the body that belongs to me. The body that belongs to me, the relation I have to this body is something very, very different. And in a way, I am, as Descartes mentions here, inter, uh, connected with my, my body in a very uh, like different way. So otherwise, I couldn't experience pain as I feel pain. It's, something, it's not something I, I realize after the harm happens. So when I, I got hurt, I feel pain, and I, it all happens at the same time as the result of a, a experience of, as I well, propose or uh, suggest to uh, present it, the deprivation of a, a, cap, a practical capability. So uh, we're about to finish. Well, there are other uh, contexts of bodily vulnerability that are related to the dimension of a uh, normative or what I call it, the, the normative di dimension of vulnerability. For me, it, well, the way I, I try, I am trying to address this uh, topic is through um, the place of affectivity in our understanding of values. Values is something, or values, sorry, values is something we are not able to understand from a only um, or a mere intellectual uh, way. 
So it's not, values are not just concepts. They are concepts that express values, but values as the meaning of values is something that somehow requires us a corporeal and especially affective uh, experience. So the, the, the affective experience. So, well, the phenomenological tradition, especially Husserl, every time he speaks about values, and he speaks of this experience of values, he says, well, values is something we feel. So as in a sentimental way. And the accomplishment of these in, intentions of, of value intentions, I mean, the, the way I refer to the things and the, um, and the way the things appears to me as valuable is related to uh, feelings. Nevertheless, Husserl usually speaks of values in terms of positive experience. So his examples are enjoyment and happiness and well, joy and so on and so forth. You know, pleasure, of course, all the time. Pleasure and pleasurable experiences. But what happens with certain values such as dignity or justice? Which are, I mean, okay, Husserl, yes, we like beauty, and this this is interesting. Also, all, all, almost all the time, his examples are beautifulness or beauty or goodness. Yes, goodness, eh, goodness can be whatever. No, 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 no. Tell me about justice. Tell me about dignity. How does it feel, dignity? Does it feel? I mean, there is a way to have an emotional understanding of dignity. Husserl, as long as I know says nothing about this. But I, what, this is what I say. I say, yes, it is possible. It's very controversial, of course, but it is possible to, to defend Husserl's position regarding the affective experience of values, even of those values that is, are, is unintuitive to think about them in terms of uh, emotions uh, or emotional experience. So, how does it feel dignity then? Well, this is the answer. I feel the lack of dignity while I suffer. While I suffer and I have the feeling that this is not just, this is not fair. So I feel unfairness. So, and I realize effectively, I realize the um, objectivity I mean, objectivity in a broad sense, of course, uh, uh, as well. Dignity is something, means, means something. There is not just words. Justice means something, is something. It's not just words. And I have, I, 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 uh, have conditions in my experience for make claims toward justice or dignity based in the lack of dignity and lack of justice, where precisely in vulnerability, and this is why vulnerability matters for understanding uh, justice and dignity. For instance, this is something of oh, certain uh, philosophers, especially in the context of justice, uh, Mexican philosopher Luis Villoro emphasized against roles. Villoro uh, attempted in his last uh, years to develop a negative theory of justice, he calls it negative because instead of making positive, a positive account of, of what uh, is justice, taking as reference the work of John Rawls, Villoro says, well, but this is abstract. This is very abstract and I can make a claim also with a, how do you say, attempting to reach certain universality I am not a, a, a relativist or some whatsoever, nor was Bioro, but we want a experiential oriented point of view for addressing these topics and not only this abstract perspective from the liberal tradition. Something is interesting in this regard as well is that also uh, people like Jürgen Habermas uh, emphasize this dimension of uh, vulnerability in order to address the uh, legitimacy of uh, human rights. 
This is also something I, I just learned a couple of weeks ago, and I am like very impressed because I had the impression that Habermas belonged to the to the other uh, the, the other side, the dark side, <laughs> the the abstract uh, theories of justice. So this is perhaps my point. We are able to um, address values, such values as justice and dignity from an experiential oriented point of view, based in a description of our condition and as vulnerable beings, which starts from analyzing and describing the experience of a bodily vulnerability. And then from bodily vulnerability, and this is why it is very important for me emphasize this uh, vulnerability in terms of, or better uh, to say, not only vulnerability, but harm in terms of deprivation or deprival of uh, practical capabilities, because this is precisely what is at the stake when we speak about liberty. So in, in a very abstract ways, I mentioned it, justice, dignity, liberty. So even equality, we can speak about equality as well, but equality belongs to a bit different context, but in context of liberty, who, has this autonomous capability for per, uh, actual performances of whatever they want or he or she wants. No, no, liberty is something that also requires a contextual and a, a, a contextual perspective and an account of how deep are our bonds with other people. So, this, there are certain ideas of liberty that belongs to the liberal tradition and this modern tradition that over overemphasize the autonomy and, so to speak, a isolated way of understanding individual person. So we are not isolated individuals. We are, we are essentially social beings. And this also means that, um, or perhaps we, we are social or our sociality, in order to say, it, our sociality is also grounded in our constitutive vulnerability. We need others and we need each other. So if we don't understand these basic uh, assumptions, how deep in our uh, condition as human beings is rooted this need of sociality, especially in the context, we can go, I am about to finish, uh, Susie. Please just let me say this because this is very, very important. We have to, we, we can get this into the context of what we are actually living now with the pandemic. So there is people that either don't believe in the virus, there is still people that is the, that thing doesn't exist. It's a, a, I don't know, it's something certain group is trying to make us. Um, taking away our control, our liberties and so on and so forth. And I heard a lot of funny stories from the States, also people that complaining because they want to get a haircut and, and their personal liberty matters uh, and so on. And yes, of course it matters. But the, the problem is we have to understand what does it mean to be free? And if you base your ideas about freedom and liberty in, a, in, in so abstract assumption of what you are, the consequences are not only bad in philosophical terms, but they have practical consequences of a catastrophe. This is a catastrophic situation we are all living here. So of course, I am not blaming all the people of what is actually happened, or for instance, here in Mexico. People just don't care. They go outside. They are not, uh, uh, um, how to say this, mandatory lockdown. So we, we live in freedom. So we can, everybody got, can go out and so on. And the government just say like, okay, take care, use a mask if you want. There, there, is, not, there is nothing like a mandatory uh, regulations. And why they say that goes be against human rights. We want to avoid violations of human rights. So we cannot like say something like you should use, you must use a mask or you must stay at home and so on and so forth. Well, this is interesting. I, I will say like, like, will like even praise my government for this. Yes, because they, they, they believe in people, but 
unfortunately, they think that people is more like Aristotelian subjects, very prudent, very wise, and they want to like stay at home by their own uh, means. And unfortunately, this is not, I don't know, this is not per perhaps the, the best way to, to do the things. However, I mean, if we address at least these topics, liberty, dignity, justice, I has presented them in different contexts, how they are all related with the condition of vulnerability. What I am saying is that most of the situation that we have now, this catastrophic situation, uh, and this is something that not only I am saying, but it's something that actually Edmund Husserl uh, mentioned it several years ago, is because we don't understand what we are. We don't understand what we are as human beings. We still are lacking of a full of the understanding of our condition, which is rooted, this is my claim, not Husserl, in vulnerability. So vulnerability is not just an, an, another predicate among others to define or describe humanity, but que perhaps is the most important dimension of humanity once we understand vulnerability beyond these ideas of weakness or fragility or a mere circumstantial situation that is subject to be overcame in certain uh, contexts. No, vulnerability is something that belongs to us essentially and is decisive for understanding the normative dimension of our experience. Dignity, justice, liberty are to be understood in this context if we want a experiential approach to this uh, dimension of, of axiology, normativity, and so on. Well, this is what I have for you. Thank you for listening to me and thank you for your patience also with my, my bad English. I, I apologize in advance. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, very you much. Ignacio. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I cannot, uh, we cannot clap you properly. <laughs> uh, it was really a great presentation. Uh, and uh, yeah, I look forward to listening to the question from uh, the audience. Uh, if you can exit uh, the PowerPoint. Oh, yes, yes. So we can see your face at least that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Cool Thank face. you. I mean, I think Victor has already a question for you. If you want to ask it yourself, Victor, it would be great. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Thanks. Uh, see if my, okay. Cool. So Ignacio, thank you for the really great presentation. Um, it reminds me of uh, I, I did a, a a paper last semester on. Uh, well-being and I, I focused on unhappiness so I guess uh, sort of in the realm of being vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, and I, I was curious with your uh, I forgot the exact point y you made but it was really recent it was toward the end um, and it was while you were talking about uh, Edmund Husserl's mm -hmm. um, ex experience and I was curious let's see let, I have my question up here I want to I wanna... okay oh, oh. Ah, okay. Well, I, what I mentioned at the end, right at the end, was that well, Husserl was criticizing in the his famous book, The Crisis of European Sciences. Uh, he was criticizing the a positivistic account of sciences. He uh, famously says that the the man of mere facts. How do you say this is? Uh, Susie, help me. <laughs> yeah, uh, a man of mere facts uh, have ideas of mere facts and values of mere facts. Uh, yeah. Exactly. I, I learned it uh, by heart in Italian, not that sentence as well. So I don't know the exact translation in English, but yeah. No, yeah, sci it's sciences. Awesome. I remember that. Sciences of, of, uh, of, of facts. Yes, sciences of facts. Uh, brings out, as a result, men of mere facts, and we are not a fact. That wasn't the, the starting point of our presentation when I was like trying to relate well vulnerability with body and distinguish vulnerability from fragility. This is that this condition is not a fact 
in terms of uh, the natural science or natural science understood in this very straight naturalistic account of what we are. This is what Husserl was claiming. No, we are, we are more than facts. We are meaning. And science is also a result of human action with a human meaning. This is what Husserl aimed in this book, to bring uh, back the sciences to the roots of their, their performances and their accounts to the what he called the life world. So in the yeah. life world, we are vulnerable. This is my point. <laughs> right. Yes. So I was curious. So, okay. So I, I think I'm on the right track when in asking you this. Um, so, and I'm citing the concept. This is from, uh, I read it in a paper from Marin Werla, but they mm -hmm. were citing Thomas Fuchs definition okay. of time as lived experience. So uh, explicit time and implicit time. Anyways, my, my question would be, uh, if what your thoughts are on if we are harmed over time, our value uh, will readjust and we become stronger. So we become more resilient and even less vulnerable. So That's and, 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 and I think I think uh, for uh, even with tragedy, which even though it's terrible, let's say if you're used to tragedy, it might not affect you as much. But even let's say we're going to school, we are. Uh, becoming vulnerable on purpose and so over time let's say when we graduate or whatever we will have these skills now because we have been vulnerable for however long that person was in school uh, so um, no it's a great question it's a great question it's a double fold uh, question because in one hand is precisely the 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 temporal dimension of vulnerability which is something i i haven't uh, I, I didn't go in definitely yet in that issue, but certainly is something very, very important because it is also belongs to our condition as human beings. We are temporal and historical beings. So this there is um, degrees and of vulnerability, of course, and this degree also belongs to a sense of time. So when we are a child, children, for instance, when we are children, we are more vulnerable, and we come, when become when we become older, we are well in certain respects less vulnerable, or at least we understand better the vulnerability, and we are able also to for taking care of others like children that are not aware of how vulnerable they are. So they, are, my point is that there are several uh, dimensions of temporality involved in vulnerability. Also, in the, the other question is great because this, this is right. And this also belongs to my point of the normativity or, or the relation between vulnerability and normativity. In certain contexts, it is important to, to get open to experiences in a way to get vulnerable in, in certain extent. Otherwise, we were not able to, to, to learn. So be, being vulnerable, perhaps in this context, is being, um, I don't know, when I, when I started this conversation with this talk to, uh, to all of you, I was afraid about my bad English. So I, I have to face to, uh, my vulnerability. So no, you're very clear, though. This is I, what I am. Very clear. <laughs> I was able to understand. This is what I am. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. But this is, what, this is the thing. And I was speaking with, with a friend yesterday. It was, oh my God, every time I have to do this, especially in this context of Zooming and I am I'm not um, confident. But other, well, my friend told me, well, you have to do it. Otherwise you won't know whether you can do it or not. Right. But what can be wrong? So, and, and, and the life is plenty of these opportunities to, to, to fail. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it is good because if you if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, yeah. as Nietzsche says. Yeah. So, uh, in certain contexts, yes, resilience uh, is the the other di dimension that belongs in other contexts of this normativity theory. It belongs to the virtue ethics. Is something that comes within the this problematization of the notion of vulnerability. So resilience. So and how we can learn from those who have passed through certain circumstances, of, of course, uh, of extreme vulnerability, 
and they survived them. We are all surviving, uh, survivors now. So we, we, we should feel proud of all of us now, since we are like able to have this conversation because right. many people is dying and suffering because of the pandemic. And not only because of virus, the virus had many social consequences that makes many people's lives very miserable. And, and we are like, uh, we have the fortune to having a talk on philosophy. We have a computer, Just, you know, this is the kind of things that in different contexts, we are all the time overcoming uh, threats and challenges and situations of more or less, uh, well, uh, vulnerable situations. And within uh, comes up also this experience of resilience that has um, consequences for, for the, I don't know, building up or constitution of the person in long terms. So otherwise we couldn't learn uh, also. I, I, of course, I am not a, a, a making an apology for, for, we all should become as vulnerable as possible. No, it's more about understanding what is to be vulnerable and all the understanding that vulnerability don't necessarily mean mean a uh, weakness it is closer to a strength as we th think usually this is something that comes from aristotle actually <laughs> vulnerability is, co is 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 closer to a strength that as that than what we in the first instance think when we uh, relate vulnerability with weakness the vulnerable is not weak; it's vulnerable. So, and the strong and the and the and the brave, according to Aristotle, is not is not the, the the fearless person. The brave is the one who understands how vulnerable he is or she is, and nevertheless fights and uh, uh, meet or cope their uh, challenges. Right. Thank you. It's like going to the gym, right? If I'm only so strong, I can only lift so much. Exactly. If I'm on 500 pounds, I might kill myself, you know, but that's, um, but let's say if I go slowly, I can eventually do 500 pounds or something like that. Yeah. So, like muscle memory. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ignacio. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. No, thank you. That, that also is also an interesting point to how the body is related with this dimension of temporality and the temporality on, of the body is also an, a very, very important issue. But I, 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 I haven't gone, uh, I didn't go to, uh, uh, deep on, on this. Thank you for this uh, suggestion. Of course. Could, very could important. I, could, I, could I type in the chat a couple uh, Thomas Fuchs and Marin Werla? Ah, uh, yes. Well, I've, I know uh, Marin Werla work is great. She's the oh. greatest on these issues. Oh, perfect. Oh, okay, <laughs> <Yes. great. laughs> okay. We all know each other in the. <laughs> Okay, Thank so I don't you. need to. Do, I don't need to. Thank you. you. But anyways, please type me the 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 papers oh, for sure. because they, they worked a lot, especially Thomas Fuchs writes a lot of things. So perhaps it is interesting to know what you're reading also. All right. Thank you very much. I will. Thank you. Okay. We have another question from Vanessa. Thank you, Nyatia, for. Um... These great answers and for the quote, uh, yeah, that was really a good one. I it was in the back of my memory. Now there's Vanessa who is asking another question. Um, do you want to ask it yourself, Vanessa? Do you want me to read? Oh. Okay. I, I I think I found it. Is okay, this one on Levinas, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. With your important or perhaps Levinas regards vulnerability in an ambivalent light. Yes. Yes, you are right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Then this is does vulnerable necessarily have such a dual dynamic if possible? And time of meeting, please read as I have an unstable connection. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, oh, I am just, I am not sure I am understanding that question as such. But we're up against the wall of existence and the face of the other challenges to us to take action. Well, Levinas is something I just I am just starting to work on now. And what, what I can say, I can say just a, a few things, very, very basic on Levinas. Um, oh, okay. 
I perhaps I can I can share uh, share my my screen again uh, again oh, here for saying something on Levinas. This is from a paper I am uh, trying to to finish now where it comes Levinas in consideration. This is a quote of of Levinas, a quote of this book on how do you say this in English? Other way of being and so on and so forth. This, this, this famous book of, <laughs> of Levinas. And well, Levinas account of vulnerability is very complex because his starting point is very philosophical thing. Sorry, <laughs> very philosophical. His very uh, starting point is uh, um, reframing our understanding of passivity. So, and he wants to speak about a radical sense of passivity, a passivity that doesn't have anything to do with any kind of activity. And this passivity also, well, is regarded to our sensibility as far as it um, exhibits a, a sense of exposedness. I don't know how to translate this in English. I say exposedness because it's, it's like getting exposed, like, like me now speaking English, <laughs> I'm exposed. <laughs> and, and, and Susie's about to put this in, in YouTube. So it's worldwide exposition. <laughs> so I am exposed beyond what I can do with what I am in a passive way. So there is no way I can like, take uh, over the what this dimension of of exposition but what actually what levinas mentions or the context of levinas belongs to the to the body and belongs to the the sensibility in the most basic sense of getting uh, well perhaps no say touched yes it's, it's, it's it regards to, to to touch so this is a quote of levinas so his point is Sensibility, he says, is exposed to the other. So this dimension of passivity allows, according to Levinas, a prim primordial experience of alterity that has anything to do with um, activity. So, and his point is this idea of having been offered without any holding back. So this is his, his point of, or this is what vulnerability in a sense, or at least in this context means for Levinas. The fact of having been offered without any holding back. So it's not that much that vulnerability is an um, prompt us to take care of the others. No, for, for Levinas is something that this responsibility belongs to what we are be, before taking an a subjective or an actual um, performance of any a kind of action. So his understanding of, of this idea of uh, ethics and, and vulnerability, or at least the, the point will, the point he's attempting to make is just to make us realize how um, fundamental is alterity for our experience. And alterity is not something as Husserl, this is, sorry, but this is like, this belongs to a very philosophical context. Husserl wanted to bring an active account of the other, an active constitution of the other. So it's from me to the other. And I am determining, the, describing uh, the features of the other. For Levinas, it's the other way around. We understand what we are as already, as you, Vanessa, mentioned it uh, very rightly, very correctly, he's reframing this notion of, I don't know the concept in English of, of Heidegger, the throne, of getting like thrown in the world. He's reframing what does this means. We, are, we have been thrown in the world, but for Levinas is as having been offered without any holding back. And this is, we are originally vulnerable. So this is very, very important for, for me, for, for my research, because perhaps in the phenomenological tradition, no one like Levinas has emphasized the constitutive dimension of vulnerability. So, but the, the context that belongs to this exposition is passivity, radical passivity, and the eruption of alterity as something that doesn't come from the I, from the, the, the self, but the other way around. 
the, what I am as a self is I am offered without any holding back to the other. So um, the, the, what, what comes first is alterity. That therefore we are um, essentially a constitutive a way uh, vulnerable, in a constitutive way vulnerable. Oh my God, this is very, very complicated uh, uh, question. Thank you for, I, I didn't know. Oh yes, I got this. Being a body, having a body. Yes, this, this work is great by Maren Werle. Yes, she, I, I know this, this, uh, this paper. Thank you, Victor. And well, I, there are many questions here. <laughs> hey, yeah, no, don't worry. They are not all questions. I'm informing also my students while uh, you are talking to give them the readings because uh, fortunately, phenomenology speaks to them. Okay. Uh, is there uh, any other question uh, you have uh, for um, for our lecture? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I, I did like the way she, uh, Vanessa uh, phrased the question. I think mm -hmm. they're rereading it. Yes, and uh, it arises from the Ilia. Yes, right. Exactly, it's being thrown in the world. So precisely, this is what Levinas is reframing. The, the being thrown in the world from Heidegger is reframed in something that uh, uh, needs, well, requires us to bring into account this dimension of vulnerability in, in order to reframe existence and all these uh, Heideggerian uh, concepts. Okay, great. Ignazio, since uh, there's no question yet, uh, but there's my personal curiosity, since I know you and uh, we are studying on uh, close uh, talk, we are studying close topics to each other. What do you think about love? I mean, oh do you gosh. think that uh, eh, we can uh, build uh, the same structure? I mean, love and vulnerability, right? They are <laughs> going hand in hand. Do you think it's possible to apply the same normative structure on love as well? I mean, can we derive, because yeah, I'm thinking about the ethics of love. Yeah. Right. And uh, I mean, Husserl speaks about uh, love values in his uh, writing as something uh, embedded in the human body that uh, generates uh, this obligation to care for the other. I guess I'm not asking a precise question. I'm just asking you to associate, <laughs> really associate on the basis of uh, your studies, of your research on vulnerability on the topic of uh, love and normativity. Well, this great question. This is what well, actually this belongs to what I am uh, trying to to think uh, and write uh, on now. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, because uh, yes, because well, in one hand I I am like attempting this description of vulnerability. This is one one part of my my research agenda. The other part is uh, Husserl's ethics. And this is something I am still trying to. I am still trying to understand, especially in the context of his uh, um, axiology. Mm -hmm. So I want to understand what values are for Husserl. I also already raised a, a criticism to Husserl today because Husserl, well, is very well. Usually, I will say better that he usually uh, speaks of values in positive contexts. And just very um, specific situations, he uh, goes to a negative experiences. But as I did mention, I think negative experiences are very important for making claims for such values as dignity, liberty, or um, uh, justice from a negative per 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 perspective. It is interesting that. Well, one of the negative dimensions Husserl uh, addresses is the experience of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And this sacrifice actually belongs to the concept when this, the, the uh, 
the live ethics uh, comes up, the, 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 the ethics of love comes up in Husserl's uh, thinking. Uh, well, I have to say this. Yes, I think it is possible to reconstruct, or well, I am still trying to follow a Husserlian point of view while um, developing this description of vulnerability. In at, at least the, the general framework is completely Husserlian because what I want is to uh, ground normative claims in basic, even corporeal experiences, just like Husserl did, uh, does. I, I prefer to speak of Husserl in present, okay? So <laughs> just like Husserl does. Uh, <clears throat> however, I think Levinas has a point. Levinas has a point because Husserl overemphasized activity, even when he speaks about love. So is, mm. love is an active engagement. Actually, his entire theory of, of values uh, is based in a, a very a strong commitment with the will and the active engagement, the active commitment, better say, active commitment with values. Mm. So the the Husserl, I remember a manuscript where he says something like, we don't only feel values, but we choose values to us. So to realize, to constitute the objectivity of a value is to bring its importance to our life, but by choosing it as something that matters to us. And I will say that the entire ethics of Husserl goes in this direction, even from the formal ethics to the late ethics. And of course, I, I read your book, uh, Susie, so I completely <laughs> agree with your account of, of Husserl ethics. So the, the, the map, the general map, I completely agree with your map. And yes, at the end, Husserl started like emphasizing a more experiential account in, in based on affectivity and in, in instincts. Yeah. However, right, uh, um, at the end of the day, he still well, perhaps it's not a, a failure, but the way he understands his ethical account, very oriented to, for instance, a Kantian or very modern, I will say very modern account of ethics, which is the constitution of an autonomous um, um, subject, even in Husserl. So Husserlian subject is affective and instincts matter also are involved with instincts and body, of course. So it's not that Kantian. However, he remains Kantian as far as he uh, overemphasizes the subjective dimension of this ethical uh, experience. And then, well, in the case of love, which is interesting, what is interesting as I mentioned it, is that, uh, I am thinking about this famous example of the of the mother. The mother, yes, the mother and, and the child. So yeah. she has to, to to choose between values she cannot weigh. So it's it's a matter of, of sacrifice, it's a matter of something that goes in a way be, beyond any calculus, rational calculus. And well, I still well. In this point, Husserl is thinking of something that at the end of the day, I have to do and not something that happens to us as is the way Levinas addresses the points. Of course, I am not saying that Levinas is right. He's not, <laughs> but, but, well, but he's making a, a good point by referring a di dimension of alterity, which perhaps is not that present in Husserl and, the, and it's the one that emphasizes the dimension of vulnerability in order to bring account of values and even for understanding what love is, like the song, you know, you wanna know what love is and so on. <laughs> well, you have to understand then what is to be vulnerable. So no one who is not vulnerable or, or not understand the, the, its own vulnerability is not able to love. So love and vulnerability are related essentially each other. So I would like say that for, for Husserl, you know, we have to pay more attention, Master, to the experience of vulnerability in order to, to support your theory of uh, uh, ethics, uh, love, ethics of love. Yeah. 
that there is a, a, a hand raised. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead, please. Um, I had a question about vulnerability, like how you defined it, because I feel okay. like you talk about vulnerability, like everyone has it, you can't avoid it. But at the same time, you're also saying like, you can have vulnerable experiences and sometimes you can choose not to have vulnerable experiences. So I was wondering if it's something that's always with you, is it like an essence of a human or is it something that's only, you can choose whether to take that possibility or not? It's a great question. <laughs> it's a great question because, the, and, and also, this, this is my problem because I, I did my best trying to avoid technicalities, but the way you pre uh, exhibited the question, something like the essence, this is precisely the point, whether it is possible to speak about essence of human beings. And I say no, because I am very existentialist in this regard. <laughs> I say no, at least no in terms of what we, uh, in tra traditional ontology, use to understand by essence. As I, I did mention at the very, very beginning of my lecture, nothing is vulnerable per se, so by definition. And the essence, well, the, 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 the definition is precisely the expression of the essence of anything, in this case, a human being. So I cannot define human, at least from this essence point of view, this essentialist framework, vulnerability is precisely what cannot belong to the definition of human being. Since it is accidental and circumstantial, cannot belong to the definition of something. This is something that belongs to the context of, of ontology. So you cannot use this kind of predicates to define anything. So especially the, con the concept of vulnerability. However, from a po phenomenological point of view, it happens that belongs to the, this particular being, the human being, that he, as Heidegger teach, taught us, uh, he or she, the Dasein is both, of course. <laughs> so the, the human existence, goes beyond this perspective of definition. There is no way to defi define in advance what a human being is because each human being is different. Each existence is the, the, the event of realization of what we are as, as, as human beings. So every definition, general definition of vulnerability, of sorry, of, of humanity, uh, remains abstract. And this is exactly my, my, my point. I am against those who wants to define human in an abstract way, because most of the times what they are like defining is something that belongs more to a, a certain ideology rather than an actual scientific uh, address to what they are want to, to talk about. In, 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 this means our uh, humanity. That doesn't mean that we cannot speak about humans at all. So we, we do, we do, and actually that's what we are doing here. But my point is that paradoxically, vulnerability, considering the type of predicate it is, which is circumstantial uh, uh, and uh, accidental, and according to the classical ontology, you cannot use this kind of predicates to define anything. This is the one that defines us the best. So be, why? Because that's, this is what we are. We are accidental and circumstantial. So the essence of what we are is expressed always in context, historical, social context that we cannot avoid in order to address, especially those topics that belong, for instance, human rights. Human rights, there is a, a manner of understanding human rights that uh, human rights are based in such a thing as human nature, so created by God or whoever. No, no, I don't take it. That doesn't mean I, 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 I am not taking the validity and the universality of human rights, I do. But it is possible for, to claim the universality and validity of human rights without 
trying to found that in such a thing as human nature. So, and how I do that? Well, I am trying to do that through a phenomenological point of view, exhibiting or emphasizing how important for understanding of humanity is vulnerability. So I, uh, so I, I am trying to, to respond to your question, but I cannot say that human vulnerability is our essence, otherwise I could like contradict myself in a catastrophic way. <laughs> but at least I, I, I hope you can get my, my, my point. I mean, why I am avoiding your question, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Thank you, Ignazio. We have, uh, we are exploiting your time. I'm so sorry, but uh, I, I would like to ask my oh, students okay. if, uh, you know, any of you or uh, the okay. audience in general, uh, if you have uh, still one more question for uh, Ignazio. Because I know, especially in my class of modern philosophy, we touched upon uh, some of these topics, you know, the observation of human okay, nature, great. understanding of feelings. Of course, uh, there wasn't uh, the core of vulnerability in uh, what we discussed, but okay. uh, we are orbiting around uh, an experiential uh, way of observing emotions. Okay. Well, great. <laughs> thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Susie. This is great. And thank you. Well, thank you stay for safe, uh, all of you. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, thank you for this amazing presentation. And uh, yeah, be safe. We will end soon, sooner or later. Okay. Okay. Thank sooner you. Sooner or later. Bye. Sorry. Bye.